So our objectives, first I'm going to talk about the different treatment for options for knees, shoulders, and hips that are arthritic. And then there's other options besides surgery. Then we're going to talk about surgery. Then I'm going to talk about the different procedures that I perform here at Monroe Clinic for arthritis of the joints. And then the last part, for the last two years about, we've been uh, collecting data on our patients. And I'm going to give you my outcome data for um, joints. The Stryker Triathlon is the knee that I put in. And the Otis Med application means the shape matching or custom knee. You might hear this in the news or around town or for somebody that had it done in Sauk Prairie. So we do that here. And the Biomet, that's for a partial knee. That's the signature application. Once again, that's the custom fit knee. And we're going to go that in more detail. And then talk a little bit about same day bilateral total knees. If you have both knees, I didn't used to do this. It's something I've started over the last year and a half. And then we're going to talk about our data that we've been collecting since June of 2010. So who's a candidate for a joint replacement? Probably most people in this room. But the first thing we want to do, make sure that you've failed conservative treatment or done the non-operative things or the easy things first. Number two, your primary complaint has to be pain. That's what I can help with for sure. It might be you want to garden more, or you want to be able to play with your grandkids, or you want to have more bend in your knee. And all those things can be helped by a total joint, but they don't necessarily always get fixed. The main thing we can help with is take away the pain. And then you have to have a desire to have it replaced. It's a lot of work. There's a lot of rehab. Probably know somebody has had one done or had one done yourself. You have to do the physical therapy if you want a good outcome. Medically appropriate. You have to be healthy enough for it. And this question usually gets answered by your primary care physician. And then age appropriate. And then we're going to go over what the age appropriateness is. So conservative treatment, if you come to my office or you start out with a primary care, doesn't matter at all. You know, first you've lived with it up until the point where you've decided to come in and see somebody. Then you might have tried anti-inflammatories. Those are like Motrin, Advil, ibuprofen. I usually tell patients that's ibuprofen's the cheapest, or one of the cheapest. It's been around one of the longest times. Comes in 200 milligram tablets. You can take four of them three times a day with food, and that's the prescription strength dose. But there are a lot of side effects, liver problems, kidney problems. If you're on Coumadin for another reason, you can't take it. If you've got heart problems, you shouldn't be taking this medication. So you have to be careful with it, even though millions of people are taking them. You can try exercise or physical therapy. We've got a great physical therapy department. They can work on strengthening the muscles around the knee, and that can help with the pain. It doesn't cure the arthritis, but it can make it feel better. If you come to my office, we might talk about injections. In the knee, there's two injections we do. Cortisone, uh, it's a shot. We give some lidocaine, which is the numbing medication, and then we give the steroid. That shot, um, you know, the same day you come and see me for the very first time, we could do that shot if you wanted. It's a quick shot. You go home. You can drive home. You can do your activities of daily life. You just can't do any extra activities that day. And that can be done in the shoulder and the knee in my office. Hips, if you have hip pain, we generally ask people to um, get seen by the radiologist and they take an x-ray image or they show the inside of the hip with the x-ray and they know where they're getting into that joint because that hip joint is deep inside and we don't always, we can't find it in the office setting. And the other type of injection we can do in the knee is a hyaluronic acid injection. You might have heard of Synvisc or Hyaligan. It's made from rooster combs. It's a thicker gel fluid that goes in your knee. This shot takes, generally we do one shot every week for three weeks. And we can give this shot every six months. Um, for patients that are a little older or have severe arthritis, it probably doesn't work quite as well. But younger patients with more mild to moderate arthritis, it's a good option. For age, this is Mary Lou Retton, and she had a hip put in when she was 35. Some of you might have heard your doctor say, well, we've got to wait till you're in your 60s before we can do a total joint. And that was kind of the thinking at one time. But now we've kind of got to the, or we've come to the conclusion that we want you to enjoy the years now, your 50s or 60s maybe, um, and not be miserable with a painful joint. So we do not have um, any age um, requirement now. Just four weeks ago, I did two total knees one person was 42, and this person was miserable. She could not 
do her activities of daily life. She could not go out and be with her kids. She could hardly do anything. And the other patient was 92. And she was still, she wanted to go golfing. And she was very active, which is great. So that same day, I did a 42-yard total knee and a 92 total knee. And they're both doing well. So here's a quiz question for you. Which surgery was first performed in 1893? Anybody got any idea? It was performed, what? I didn't catch that, sorry. Oh, you're talking about uh, bone surgery, okay. More than likely I'm talking about bone surgery. <laughs> I don't know much about that other stuff, so. Performed by a French surgeon, Pan, for tuberculosis. That probably doesn't give it away. Nine muscles cross this joint, which the sur surgery is performed on. That's kind of tough, too. It's a ball and socket joint that allows the most movement and used the most in the body and was replaced. Exactly. Shoulder replacement. So that leads us to shoulder arthritis. I have one procedure that I do here at Monroe Clinic for shoulder arthritis, and that's the Biomet Copeland humeral resurfacing head. There are a few other procedures that you might have heard of. You might have heard of people that had a total shoulder where they replaced the ball and the socket. Uh, you might have people that just had a hemiarthroplasty of the shoulder where they just replaced the ball. And then there's actually another surgery out there where they've reversed it. They've turned the socket part into the ball and the ball part into the socket. And that's a reverse total shoulder. But for the vast majority of patients that I see, um, they can um, benefit from uh, humeral resurfacing. And if you have a condition that requires that reverse total shoulder arthroplasty, I usually refer people up to Madison for that. So the candidates, shoulder pain, you failed those easy things that we talked about earlier, the living with it, the medications, the therapy, cortisone injection, time. You have a desire for a shoulder replacement, and your x-rays show that you have this problem, arthritis. We generally like the resurfacing I do, generally your rotator cuff needs to be intact, but the reason for your arthritis can be variable. You can have osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, you can have avascular necrosis, or you can have um, arthritis in your shoulder because you've had it injured traumatically in the past. Here's some x-rays. If you come to my office with shoulder pain, we generally get four views of the shoulder or four x-rays. X-ray department's right next to us. It's very convenient. And it shows what arthritis looks like of a shoulder. Things you can see is this big spur down here. And there should be a space between this ball and this socket. You can see it up here too. There's no space between the ball and the socket. When patients lose that joint space, that's a sign of arthritis. So the Biomet Copeland, it's been in existence since 1986. It's got the longest um, clinical research done on it, over 20 years. And you don't lose as much bone, so if it wears out in 20 years, it's a little easier to go and replace it. And here's just an example of, if you can get the idea of what it is. This is your arm bone, your shoulder, and it kind of ends in a ball. And we put this new metal cap on the top of it. And here's some x-rays of one of my patients that show a resurfacing. And then we got a little video I'm going to show you of a patient, Sandy Buell. Sandy Buell. My name is Sandy Buell and I'm from Monroe, Wisconsin. The procedure I had was total left shoulder resurfacing. I had that procedure done because I had so much pain. My shoulder was locking up it felt constantly gnawing pain in, in it, and I just, I couldn't do things I wanted to do. I couldn't do, do my job properly anymore, and I was afraid I'd lose my job if I couldn't do my, you know, work with my shoulder. I couldn't sleep at night. Uh, my shoulder hurt so bad, I could not get it comfortable. No matter what position I laid it in, it would not stop hurting. About, about six years ago, I went to Dr. Sadoff because I had a lot of pain in the shoulder and he did some cortisone shots. Um, they helped for a while and then I, after the third one, he said that he would probably have to do surgery on my shoulder. I chickened out. <laughs> and I suffered for four more years. And it hurt so bad 
by the time I finally gave in and had the surgery done, and the surgery has relieved all the pain. I chickened out f from having the surgery because I was, I was really afraid to have it done. I didn't know what would happen. I didn't know if I'd get all my motion back or all my strength back, but I, I shouldn't have chickened out because it really has healed really well and I can do anything I want to do now. I did physical therapy. It was one of the best things that anybody could do. Whoever does it should go through the whole thing and do exactly what they tell you to do because that's what gets you your motion back. I had a great physical therapist. She had a lot of humor um, and we had a lot of fun even though I had some pain too. <laughs> but uh, she helped me to reach my goals to what I wanted to do. My life is better now because I can do anything I want to do that I could, I could do before my shoulders started hurting. I can do my flower gardening again and everything at work that I do, I can do with no problem. My advice to anyone about thinking about having this surgery, they should just do it because it takes the pain away. Um, you have a little bit of pain when you're first working out and stuff, but that pain goes away. Just do it. <laughs> yeah, so that, I thank Sandy Buell for doing that. And kind of just a testimony of how well she is doing. She did bring her husband in for a total hip about six weeks ago and he's doing well too. So my shoulder resurfacing, I began doing the Copeland in 2008. It's not a procedure I do quite a few of. I only did four last year, but I've already performed three this year, and I have one scheduled um, for next month. Um, so it is becoming more and more popular. I think not even the physicians here at the Monroe Clinic actually knew that I was doing this procedure. So that's one of the reasons I'm coming giving talks, and I talk to our nurses and um, physicians here is just to get the word out that if you're having shoulder pain or arthritis there, I can help that out. Subjectively, they've been more satisfied than the patients that I used to do when I did the hemiarthroplasty. And I have done um, both sides on a patient. So it's so another quiz question. We got the first one. So this, what procedure was first done in the U.S. in 1970? Billie Jean King, Liza Minnelli, and Jane Fonda have had this done. Knee replacement, yeah. Dr. Nodgett performed the first in Monroe, and um, it's the most common joint replacement surgery I do. And that's a total knee arthroplasty. So there's two procedures really I do for arthritis when it gets to that point. One is a total knee arthroplasty. We replace the top, the femur, the top bone, and the lower bone, the tibia, and then the patella or the kneecap, and put a plastic piece in between. And when I do that, I use the striker triathlon with this uh, shape matching technology that I'm about to talk about. And then there's a the unicondylar knee replacement, which is um, if you have only arthritis on the inside of your knee, here's a model of it. We just replace that inside with a new two metal components with, once again, a plastic piece that slides on the metal piece. And that's a unicondylar, and we're going to talk about those too. So the candidates, once again, it's knee pain. That's failed conservative measures. You've tried, once again, living with it. You've tried the anti-inflammatories. You've maybe done physical therapy or exercises. You've had a cortisone shot, and you've given it time. And then I basically tell people, if it's keeping you from doing activities, you don't want to give up. That's when I would consider having it replaced. So here's x-rays, once again, of a knee. If you come to my office for this, we get four views usually. One on the left shows the knee standing straight up, top bone's a femur, lower bone's a tibia, little bone's a fibula. You should have about a finger breast space between these two bones. And on the inside, it's pretty much bone on bone arthritis. That's looking from the side on the top right hand corner. And this is just a picture, the bottom right hand picture is a picture of your patella sitting in the groove. Yeah, kind of the buzzwords out there. Another one point that I wanted to focus on today or talk about is um, custom fit knee or shape matching. Because you might have heard of it, it's been around for I think over two years by um, the Biomet company that's here today. Their signature application for total knees 
And I know people have gone to other areas around here because they had it, and we did not have that in Monroe until uh, this past um, November or so. So what do we do, or how does it work? Well, if you come to my office and you want a total knee, the new parts are now we get an MRI of the knee. MRIs that test where you lay in a tube, and it takes pictures. Now, if you have a pacemaker or you just can't handle an MRI, we can do a CT scan or a CT arthrogram where we put some dye into your knee and take a picture. But that shows a better picture of the knee than um, the regular x-ray. So here's, the, here's an MRI scanner on the right, and that's a MRI picture of the knee on the left. You know, there's no needles, it's not invasive, it's just a tighter space that uh, about 10% of the people are claustrophobic and just cannot tolerate an MRI. So then we send this image, goes off to um, California. And in California, they put the information that they received from the MRI into a computer and they make a 3D model of your knee of how it looked when you had your cartilage and before it became degenerative. And then they send me a picture of that model on the computer screen with their interpretation of how the components should look and how, what size they should have and where they should be placed. Prior to this, so you have to know a little bit of how it used to be done. It used to be done, we didn't decide the size of the knee or where the cuts were until we were in the operating room. And in order to find out where to put those cuts, we often had to put a rod up the thigh bone or down the lower leg bone. And now with this technique, uh, we do not have to do either of those. So that's one reason people seem to bounce back, have a quicker recovery. So then I look at this and I take what the computer has showed and I decide where the implants should go. And then we send this information back to uh, California. And after they, we've decided that, they make these two cutting guides. These are two plastic pieces that um, the company in California sends us the day of your surgery. So when we're doing surgery, we open up the knee, we find the top bone, and we clamp this plastic piece, or pin this plastic piece in <coughs> position. And there's a little slot for a blade, and then it cuts your knee right where the computer and your surgeon decided that it should be cut. And then we put another cutting block on after that one to make four additional cuts. And then the lower piece is what fits on your tibia, your lower bone. Once again, that sets on there. We pin it in place, and it tells us exactly where to make the cut. So that's where you get your custom fit. It's, the computer has decided specifically where we want to cut your knee for this knee replacement. And it's shape matching, so it matches you. So then afterwards, here's a picture of a shape match knee. The white is the metal components. They're made out of cobalt chrome. The femur is the top bone. Tibia is the lower bone. And the kneecap is the little bone in front. And that has a plastic piece that we put on it. So this, the knee that I use, and I've been using since, I think, about 2006 or so, is the triathlon uh, knee system. It's designed for your natural knee movement. Just wanted to show you one more thing about this knee that you might see, because this is going to be in um, newspapers or magazines. It's going to be in um, different print. Um, it's going to just explain the knee that I use, the striker knee. Their idea is that you should replace the knee with this one curvature, so it's round. Other knees sometimes have different curvatures, uh, unlike your native knee. So, Stryker's whole concept or whole um, marketing campaign is going to be about replacing your knee kind of with a circle and avoid the oval, which is what this picture is showing. And once again, there's uh, some x rays of one of our total knees that was done with the shape matching. So, that same knee, that Stryker knee, uh, we can replace both at once. For the first 12 years I was in Monroe, we didn't do it. I thought it was too much surgery. And um, where I was trained, we only did bilaterals when um, we had two surgeons doing it. But with this new technology and the way we're doing knees, a total knee only takes about 45 minutes or not even to perform. So 
we can do two of them in an hour and a half. So it's not that much operative time. There's a lot of surgeries that take over an hour and a half, and there's, you know, there's plenty of orthopedic surgeons that take an hour and a half to do one knee. So I had a patient request it. I've done four of them so far, and each time they've been very happy, so I keep doing it. But I've only done four. I do have one scheduled for the next month. Um, the last person that I did was uh, one of the, was the first day that the new OR was opened up, did the surgery on Monday, and she went home with bilateral knees on Thursday. So then the other option, if you have only arthritis on the inside, is a unicondylar knee replacement or half a knee replacement. Uh, the one that I use is designed just for inside knee pain, which is by far the more common type of, uh, more common location to have knee pain. Once again, you've had to fail conservative measures. There are a few other requirements. Uh, one, you have to have your anterior cruciate ligament intact, a ligament in your knee that holds the top bone to the lower bone. Uh, you can have bow-leggedness that is too extreme. It has to be relatively, it has to be stable um, and secure from side to side too. And here is a preoperative x-rays of a patient that had a unicondylar knee. Once again, as I talked before, you want to have about a finger breast space between the femur and the tibia and on the outside, this is your fibula, so we know it's the outside, that's maintained. But on the inside, it's bone on bone arthritis. And here is a picture of the Oxford unicondylar knee. Um, you have a metal component, fits on the femur, then you have that plastic piece that slides, it's mobile bearing, it's not fixed, and then you have a lower tibia component. Um, one, it allows for kneeling. For patients with total knees, one of my recommendations is that you do not kneel on it after I replace it. Because in a total knee, I cut the kneecap in half, or I shave off the back half of it, and put a plastic piece with little pegs in it. So that makes it thinner, and has these little pegs that can act as wedges. And if you kneel on it, you could crack it. Now, I've been doing it once again for 14 years. I tell everybody not to do it, so we haven't done it. And there are some physicians that do allow patients to kneel. Um, but in a unicondylar knee, you have your native kneecap, so you definitely can kneel. Quicker recovery. There are some institutions where you can go home the same day with a partial knee. We generally tell patients that you go home the next day. Less bone. Once again, you're not, you're just kind of shaving the cartilage off just on one side. So you're not taking as much bone off as if you would be doing a total knee. And generally patients have an increased range of motion with the unicondylar knee. It's the most widely used unicondylar knee. And it's got the most data on it. And that's why I've been, um, right, I've been using this also since um, 2008, fall of 2008. And Biomed has the same technique where this Biomed unicondylar knee is custom fit for your body. Uh, once again, we get an MRI. This time it gets sent to Belgium. I'll get, a I'll get a computer screen like this that the representative and I will look at and then decide how to position to make sure that the bone is covered and make sure it's the right size. And then after we do this, we send these results back to Belgium. And once again, they send us these personalized positioning guides. So here's a picture of these plastic pieces. They actually also send you a, a model of the knee. So I, before I put it on your knee, I can take it on and off the knee that it's the model of your knee and see how it fits. So then we make an incision. It's probably only four inch incision. And then we clamp on first one on the femur, the top bone, your thigh bone, and then one on the tibia, your lower bone, and we make those cuts. So once again, it's a custom fit knee and shape match with shape matching technology. So it matches the shape of your individual knee and then you get the Oxford unicondylar knee. And here's x-rays of um, one of my patients that underwent the unicondylar knee. And this technology for the unicondylar knee has only been around since January of this year. So we actually, in Monroe, Wisconsin, got to be, I think, the second person in the state to use this technology in here. So that was kind of exciting. My name is Lois Niedermeyer, and I had a knee replacement at Monroe Clinic. 
I just thought something needed to be done and I thought anything would be better. <laughs> and I really wasn't afraid. I had confidence in him as a surgeon and I think he did a good job. I was walking right away to the bathroom and everywhere right afterwards. My knee feels great and I have, um, I think it gets better and stronger all the time. Well, if I hadn't had my knee replacement, my life would have been a lot different because I wouldn't have been able to walk anywhere. I was, um, well, here's one way. I went to a car show with my husband and I was looking for some place to sit down all the time. And the only place to sit down was in the back of a car. So I went and sat down in the back of cars if I saw somebody else sitting in the back of cars there. And I was checking out the back space, but really I was sitting because I wanted to rest my knee. And just not too long ago, I went to a car show with my husband and I walked all over and looked at all the cars and I didn't sit down once. <laughs> and then we left. <laughs> so that was one big way. My husband thinks I improved. <laughs> so my knee experience, um, this year I've done two unis, partial knees, and I do 27 total knees. So in my practice, I do quite a few more total knees than I do unicondyl or knee replacements. But it's, you know, you just have to have the right patient for each surgery. So that's what I do. Last year, uh, last year I only operated on total joints for a nine out of 12 months, so it's a little lower, but I did 11 unis and 62 total knees. So since 2007, or since I've, I've performed over 400 uh, total knees. So everybody probably knew what the next question was gonna be for the quiz, so I had to change it up a little bit. And most people probably know Dr. Nodget here. What year did Dr. Nodget perform the first total hip arthroplasty in Monroe? Anybody, any idea? 76. Not 76. Dallas Cowboys won the Super Bowl. No Cowboy fans. Here's the only medical trivia I could find for that year. MASH premiered. 1972 is the answer. That is true. Watergate scandal begins too. So Dr. nodget has been doing total knees in Monroe now. or They've been, be been done for 40 years in Monroe. So who's a candidate for a total hip? Once again, anybody with, with hip pain? Tried the easy things, living with it, the anti-inflammatories, therapy, maybe a cortisone injection. But once again, if you come to see me, I'm going to refer you to the radiologist to do the cortisone injection so they can do it under an x-ray machine to make sure we get the medication where it needs to be. And then you have to have the desire for a total hip. For hip arthritis, I really, at this point, am doing one surgery. Now, it was a total hip arthroplasty. What I for the vast majority of patients, definitely everybody over 65, I do a hip with a metal ball in a plastic or polyethylene cup. Younger patients, I sometimes use ceramic on ceramic. Now one of the things that patients come into my office quite often is if, and a lot of people have heard, there was a recall on a total hip, and that was a Depew hip that probably got the most publicity of all the joints that have had recalls. And that was a metal, on metal hip and so I do not perform that surgery it's still being done in the United States I just saw in the last month that there is a big organization in Britain that is recommending to their physicians not to perform metal on metal total hip arthroplasties anymore I used to do hip resurfacings and that's kinda of like that shoulder that I showed you earlier where you just smooth the ball and that was a metal on metal uh, device. But that, you have to do the right patients. And now with metal on metal losing favor, uh, and the amount of right patients or good candidates that I see, not very large, I don't feel comfortable doing it anymore. I have stopped doing um, hip resurfacings. So if you come to my office with hip pain, the first thing we'll get is we'll get two x-rays of your hip. It shows us the ball in the socket, and once again, um, you've lost that space, you have spurs, and that's what the x-ray shows us. Here is the components that I do. I use for my total hip arthroplasties. Metal stem, and then the metal ball, and a uh, 
polyethylene or that plastic liner. And on the right is the other option that I commonly use for patients under 65, the ceramic. Unlike the metal on metal, the ceramic is more biocompatible. We don't worry about ions or anything in your body. It does have a good wear characteristic where it's not going to wear down. It's a very strong material. Ceramics, that biocompatibility, that's the difference between that and metal on metal. And here's a picture of a total hip where you have a metal stem going down your thigh bone with the metal ball, which you can't see in the liner. And those two screws help hold the metal cup in place. My name is Karen Anderson. I'm from Monroe, Wisconsin. I had a hip replacement done. Um, it hurt when I went to stand. It was just like my hip would lock. Um, and sitting was getting to be very uncomfortable. Walking, I'd, be, I'd have to kind of, when I'd stand up, I'd have to kind of get my balance and then, then walk with discomfort. And it, it was getting to the point that it was uncomfortable at work. So it was slowing, slowing me down. I, I'm usually quite an active person and to have this slow me down was very frustrating. I guess I had uh, faith in Dr. Sadoff. Uh, when I went to see him, he, he made it clear that it was my decision to have surgery. He, he knew that he could give me some cortisone shots to prolong it, but it was not gonna be the cure. And he said I would know when it was time to have the surgery, and I did. And he was, I felt very comfortable with him. As far as activities go, I'm looking forward to doing everything that I could before surgery, or in better, without pain. Being able to walk whatever amount of time, or distance I want to walk, um, being able to climb steps, being able to play with my grandkids, just uh, back to a normal life. I had a total hip replacement done. I've, this is my second one. I had my first one three years ago, and now this one 11 weeks ago. So I'm basically pain-free. So my total hip experience, um, it's less than knees. I've done 10 so far this year, as of a month ago. Last year in that nine months, I did 28. I've done about 151 since 2007. I like doing hips. I feel comfortable doing, with, doing them. Yeah. That's not Mary Lou Retner. That's not her hip. But that's, you know, kind of before, that's how we, you know, what you could do is decide how well the hip, how well it turned out. But just since June of 2010, we started doing some studies, some outcome studies. So what does that mean to you as a patient? Well, if you come to see me and you decide that you want a new hip or a new knee, uh, we do two questionnaires. Uh, for the hip, we do a Harris hip score, which is one that my office staff uh, fills out with you, and does some measurements of how well your leg moves, if you have any leg length inequalities, um, what your pain is, what it's keeping you from doing. And the second one is the Oxford hip score, which um, you fill out. It's a 12 questions, and there's five answers um, from, you know, you can do everything you want to do till the worst, you can't do anything. And then, so, with those five answers, each get a point. So the top score would be a 60. Um, and they've looked at it, and any score under 20, you have severe pain, and you'd benefit from talking to an orthopedist about uh, total uh, knee or total hip arthroplasty. Between 20 and 30, you uh, should see your primary care doctor or get seen by an orthopedic surgeon. And over 30, generally, um, you can try conservative measures on your own, uh, anti-inflammatories and giving it time. So the knee outcome, once again, the knee society score, and that score goes up to 100. 80 and 100, you're doing excellent. And then 70 to 80, and 60 to 70, you're doing good and fair. And then below 60 is poor. And the Oxford knee score is that 60-point score I just went over. So this is the knees that we've done in the last two years with the knee society score. So our average person that comes and sees us gets a score of 46.9, which is well under 60. So they're doing poor. And then by six weeks, they're already up to 75.4, which is putting them on the mid portion between good up to excellent. By six months, they're over the excellent category level with 81.4, and they continue to improve 
at a year where they're at 86. This is the office looking at your x-rays and talking to you. How does it compare to how you feel, the patient? Well, my average person that does the Oxford knee score starts at 22.3, which puts them just over that very poor, but still in the bad enough range that they should have something done. And then it moves up to 33.4 by six weeks, which is the level that you're already doing good or don't need any kind of treatment. And then it continues to improve to 39.8 and 42.3 by a year. And this is just another slide to just go over real quickly. It shows us how you're doing before and how you're doing afterwards. I think the mean person makes us jump up of at least 15 points. Then you might wonder how well those shape matching are doing. Well, unfortunately, we just started doing them in uh, November. So we have very limited data. We just have the pre-op data and the six-week data for um, both Oxford and Nice Society. So we kind of compared those to the ones that didn't get it. The Nice Society, or the patients with shape matching, are doing a little bit better at six weeks, but with the on the knee society score, but doing, and a little bit better on the Oxford. So they're doing a little bit better, but we really don't have enough data to say much. Hip, once again, you come in, you'll do one form, the office staff will do one form, and once again, patients I operate on are all doing, are averaging well below poor. At six weeks, they're doing good, and then by six months, um, the average is excellent. Same with Oxford, um, start out at 18, well in that poor range and then move up. Once again, here's a quick slide to show you the improvement of each. It goes blue, maroon, blue, maroon, and shows the pre and post for the different patients. So that was kind of, I did a lot of talking there and I uh, just, so hopefully people can understand what, um, who is a candidate for a joint replacement surgery. Hopefully now you might know a little bit about the different procedures that I perform here at Monroe Clinic for arthritis and then you know our results.